Okay, hey, so as we're going to get started here, um, again, we're just trying to use this to get you a better understanding so that you can continue to go th through this over and again. Um, but let me give you a quick overview. So like chapter three, four, and five are all views on why it is that delinquency happens. And so right here in chapter three, we're going to be talking about individual views. We're in chapter four, we're going to be talking about sociological views. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in chapter five, we're going to talk about developmental views. And each one of those views are slightly different, but it basically talks about how a youth is impacted and why how and how is impacted is why they do the things that they do that are involved in delinquency. So, so specifically in chapter three, we're going to talk about, as you can see here, it says choice and trait. Um, I don't know why they didn't, but there's also, um, yeah, well, there's choice and trait. And inside choice and trait, there's going to be some psychological theories and some biosocial theories. And again, I don't want to get way too beauty, uh, wordy on you just yet because I don't want to sort of cloud your head. But just sort of think of it as this, is that uh, in individual views, there are two umbrellas of why things happen. One is called choice theory and the other one is called trait theory. And under choice and trait, there's certain things that happen that split off from that different, um, different ideas. So we'll get started here. So, so what the heck is a uh, choice theory or a rational theory? And basically what that means is that a, uh, if I say a kid from here on out or a juvenile, but basically what I'm saying is that when a kid is getting ready to decide if they want to, let's just say, steal something, they have to make a choice. And this is where the word comes from. So basically they have to choose to engage in the behavior or not engage in the behavior. And what they do is they, they basically weigh the consequences and the benefits to the crime that they're getting ready to commit. Um, that is like the overview definition of what this is about. And, I, and I'm, again, I think it's gonna come up here in the slides as well too, but you can also uh, find that on page 58. Um, but uh, a while back, uh, there's a fellow named uh, Beccaria. Uh, Benton, again, is uh, one of his uh, sidekicks. But essentially what happens with uh, uh, Beccaria, they start looking at why it is that is causing uh, the behavior to take place. And you're gonna see this continuing to say that uh, their theory a while back was called the classical theory, but now it's now known as uh, choice theory, and, um, and it basically, as I said before, basically that people consider their consequences prior to commission of their behaviors, and but that's only after sort of weighing in on what it is that the benefits or the consequences of their decision. So uh, this assumes that people have free will to choose their behavior. Now understand, I mean, Beccaria was a very long time ago where drugs and alcohol, or essentially just drugs, were really not part of a juvenile's life, where we're seeing that more and more today that it is. So it's sort of a clean way of thinking. Um, that makes sense to you. So as you can see here, it says uh, how kids are uh, 
Um, basically, they're there for an opportunity or a, a need, and uh, that will also uh, play, and you'll also hear that as well, too. The reason why we steal is the reason why that we um, uh, want to, uh, we want to be able to be more around what's called uh, affluent families. Um, and, but essentially, that's what, that's what people would think. But really, you can understand is that more, more places, the more affluent families are the ones that actually choose to break the law. And um, some of the delinquent motives include, as we just talked about earlier, the economic need and an opportunity. Uh, it's just a, a, an idea of problem solving. So again, there's a little bit of a, a rush to it. Um, false expectations which basically means that, you know, people will look at me in a more cooler sense if it is that, um, you know, because I have these type of items. Um, and the opportunity. Now, this is quite an interesting thing because what they're saying is that is, and we'll hopefully talk about this in a later slide, but I'll talk a little bit about now they're basically saying is that if there's an opportunity to do it, kids have to make the choice. So it's sort of interesting that it's sort of a self-blaming um, idea as well too. Now, uh, the routines activity theory, this is different than the choice theory. Okay, it's different than the choice theory, but it's also, um, part of the choice theory, but it's it, it's a little bit different. So it still stays under that umbrella. So again, this sort of branches off a little bit of that last uh, slide where we're talking about the opportunity. And we can see uh, Co Cohen is actually the name that's most associated with that. Um, I'll read a little bit this here, but the view that the crime is a normal functioning of routine activities of modern living. Um, this is a, a, interesting what they're basically saying here is that this is this is just part of growing up and being a, a juvenile that you are uh, again routinely in and around this from time to time so that's where the actually idea came from but uh, what they really keyed on is this uh, predatory the predatory crimes so uh, violent crimes against persons and crimes in which an offender attempts to steal an object from its holder are influenced by three variables and, and this is important because what this does is that it talks about again the how and the why um, this delinquency uh, takes place and these variables have to be essentially there in order for a juvenile to do something so they have to have an availability, availability of a suitable target so the examples they give are like costly jewelries, expensive cars, and easily transportable goods. They also have to have the absence of a capable guardian. So no police officers around, no homeowners, no security systems. And that they, the presence of, uh, there's a presence of motivated offenders. So you have youth who are unsupervised or unemployed uh, or an addicted uh, population. So, uh, you know, with that, I mean, again, that's, there, there is some truth into this, obviously, um, but when we go into how it is that we can stop this as police officers um, or a criminal justice system, that's when those three variables are actually quite interesting. Um, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit and maybe in a little bit later, but at the same time, what I will offer up this to you is that what's called, a, a, uh, this is not in the book, but this is from my past experience. And what's called um, SEPTEB, and it's called, uh, it's S, S or C P T E D, and it's Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit later, but those are basically uh, reducing the areas for suitable targets and, and it definitely is um, something that uh, that does reduce crime um, if you look into your text this is what they're actually talking about on page 65 
in the upper part here, and they're talking about um, one of the number one ways that uh, people end up uh, not deciding to do crimes. If they see that there's a camera around, they're more apt to not want to do that. Um, so again, that's just a, something that because it's hard for us to uh, control the other factors, but if we can control the potentially the make these suitable targets unsuitable um, through cameras or security systems, then essentially what it is that we uh, we can actually reduce it in that area. All right. Oh, okay. So I guess I should have just flipped this over. But again, you can talk, you can hear about what it is that I was just talking about. You can see it more visually. And then obviously in those darker blue sections is where those three areas interact. And then the darkest area is where delinquency occurs. So again, how it is, how is it that we um, can prevent it? How can we prevent delinquency from choice theory? Um, and so do you remember like last chapter when we started talking about um, a little bit about what's called general deterrence? Actually, we talked about that in the intro con to corrections. Um, uh, but general deterrence, and uh, you'll see in the next slide here, specific deterrence. But the general deterrence essentially is uh, the concept that uh, that the choice to commit delinquent acts are to controlled by the threat of punishment. And it's pretty simple. Basically what it basically says is that um, if you, if people are in fear that they may have to do a long prison sentence term, they won't do it. Well, that may take the idea out of it for most of the people, but there's still people that do it. So a guiding principle of deterrence is based on what? That there's a severity of the punishment, um, that the certainty of the punishment, and the swiftness of the punishment. And, and I want you to actually think about that for, for a second. But uh, you know the, the certainty of the punishment and the swiftness of the punishment and the severity, if I am a juvenile and I'm 14 or 15 years old and I do something and I'm being tried as a juvenile, well, I'm not going to get sent. There's not enough juvenile housing for me. And they're just going to send me back. And what we learned, obviously, in some of this that you were in my corrections class, um, you, you, there's, you're just going to get put on probation. I mean, you really have to screw up in order to do that. So that's why you'll see sometimes um, uh, for narcotics dealing and stuff of that nature, they'll actually have juveniles go out there and move the drugs the adult will because if they get caught what happens hardly nothing to them so that's not on a general uh, deterrence of it um the way and the cost and the benefits of them going back to the the choice theory it, it to them it's not anything right so um there is evidence that the evidence that adolescents perceive they will be arrested and punished for a crime will often forego delinquent acts well we know that that's not true that's in theory Yes, but in specific deterrence, other than general deterrence, if young offenders are punished severely, they will not repeat their illegal acts, that they're hopefully going to learn from their own mistakes. Now, let me see here. So if they're gonna learn from their mistakes, I mean, some of the issues with that is, oh, let me go back. I sort of messed that up. So just going to talk about, oh, I'm like, here, actually, this is what I wanted to talk about. So um, so problems with strict deterrence theory is this. Is that number one, minors are not rational. They, they don't make rational decisions, the ones that are involved in uh, delinquency. So um, and the experienced offenders do not fear the legal consequences. We just spoke about that just a little a few minutes ago, they understand that nothing is going to happen to them. Um, it's the ones that are the first timers that really realize that there's not crime in their family that, again, that will work. And that there's a high risk offenders may not fear getting arrested. And, and that basically, know, they know that there's a slight chance that you're going to actually get caught. 
all the crimes that are out there committed, you just are not in a good chance to get caught. Um, many juveniles are on the influence of drugs and alcohol. Well, if I'm using drugs and alcohol, I can't make clear decisions, right? I can't make rational decisions. Uh, juveniles often commit crimes in groups. So again, there's co-offending. So um, back on page in your text, um, maintaining respect on page 61, there's a nice article on there called uh, Code of the Street. And basically what that means is that um, those that go out and commit crimes together, it's sort of, and we're going to learn about this uh, when we get to, I think it's chapter eight or nine, we're talking about gangs and how they operate as a family and affirm each other and the acts that they commit. So uh, again, uh, we know that uh, most serious delinquents are not able to comprehend the consequences. Um, it's hard even at, uh, you know, obviously, uh, hopefully I'm not near the end of my life, but, uh, you know, in my start in my 50s, I understand that there will be an end of my life. But when you're young, right, you basically feel that you're going to live forever. And going out there and do a serious crime, you just won't, you can't comprehend what, you know, 15 years or 20 years is onto a sentence because you've not even lived 20 years yet. You're basically just in thought of what's today or maybe even next week. So on the other side of that, the last one, uh, punishment, punishment may produce defiance rather than deterrence. So basically what we know with that is that uh, kids who are harshly treated may want to show that they cannot be broken by the system. And basically what that means is that um, because of their upbringing, um, that individual uh, will basically just say, you can't break me. Um, and I will tell you specifically the serial rapist that I have, and I know I use that a lot, but again, it's fresh in my mind, um, was in juvenile custody several times and just basically was a hard head about it and continued his acts as a an adult. So situational crime prevention. Hey, uh, one, one thing I wanted to add, add into that, uh, the other section, just the last page was this, is that, um, you know, one of the things that there is, that there definitely is evidence that shows that uh, deterrent measures can work with the novice offenders. So again, we, we did hear that, you know, if they're educated and been in the system and stuff of that nature, they're not going to, uh, you know, offend. And if they do offend, just uh, for those for, uh, you know, minor or petty offenses, um, we know that uh, they will essentially not be involved. But uh, the higher the level offenses, that's where the lower rate of the uh, discouragement could be. So, um, but again, uh, this is a this is a situation now. And we're moving into this next one again. So it's called this is the situational crime prevention. This is again not a theory of choice or delinquency, but it's basically how to prevent crime. And we talked about that uh, intersection there, back where the uh, blues were at, and you can see that again, except for it's green on 64, page 64. And this is gonna talk about the suitable targets. So if we're in, if we can, in this uh, thought process, if we can actually reduce the delinquent activity, you must realize that in that one section of situations, and again, I use that term uh, septed, um, if we can reduce those so that they're not so, uh, seen as like a, a potential target. Uh, we can show that they're guarded. Uh, we can uh, show that the uh, uh, that these areas are monitored. We can show that the, uh, the, the means to actually commit the crimes are controlled. Well, then we can reduce those efforts. So situational crime prevention strategies are essentially designed so that we can make it difficult for that individuals when they're making their choices, right? Their choices, the choice theory, 
on if they want to do it or not. So um, I'm going to skip down a little bit when we get to the situational crime preventions include hot spots and crackdowns. And this is not, you know, just for those for juveniles. This is a tactic that's used for uh, law enforcement in general. Um, but it's again, it's a, an adult used on adults as well, too. So what the idea is, is that if we know, right, I'm going to give you a quick example here, that if we know that a said liquor store um, is um, uh, getting single cans of beer stolen out of their freezer or their refrigerator, not their freezer, uh, their refrigerator, then essentially what would end up happening is that we can monitor that. Have you ever been into the store, in the uh, a liquor store, and the first thing that you see when you walk in is what? They have a camera in the door. So now they know that you know that, you, so now you know that they know that you're walking into the store so they can identify you. And right off the back, most of the uh, people that are going to go and do this we're like, oh shit, they're gonna find out who, that it's me. So I'm not gonna participate in any actions in there. Sometimes they'll actually even step it up where they'll end up having, I just changed uh, changed here, but I'm gonna just offer this before we go to the next one. Sometimes they'll actually move the cameras so that they're right there in front of the uh, single beer refrigerator. Sometimes to add on to it, what do you see? You actually see a person a security guard in there as well too well those are all of those that's that idea on situational crime prevention and it's basically to let them know hey if you do this we are going to catch you and we're trying to use that to uh, change their choices on making that decision okay so um I'm going to move on to what's called the trait theories, and this has to do with biosocial and psychological views. And before we get into that, we're going to sort of talk about where the trait theory came from. So again, I want you to think of that that trait theory is a and is a big umbrella, right? So there's a there's two big umbrellas, which is choice and trait. And under the trait theory umbrella, there's called the biosocial and the psychological views. So in the, uh, in the trait theory itself, what sort of came from is this guy named uh, Cesar Lombroso, which is quite an interesting theory. But basically what he said, and, and it's interesting that the book really doesn't go into it too much, but basically the idea was is that he feels that there were people that were born criminals, okay? And it wasn't because of uh, what do you want to say it wasn't because of anything of their choices or anything of that nature they were just born criminals uh, he was born bad right um, and or she was born bad but he had it actually knocked down so that it was uh, you know they had in the statement here but this is this is true um, it was uh, basically that they had uh, like uh, enormous jaws uh, strong canine type teeth uh, flat nosed. Um, what are some of the other things here? Uh, Super numeral teeth, uh, which basically means like double rows, as in snakes. And so basically, if you looked like these people, um, that uh, you had characteristics of apes whose forelimbs are used in walking and stuff, you're sort of thought to not have like a a mind of the uh, I want to say primitive, but uh, you were thought to have the mind of a primitive type person and not like have the uh, understanding of uh, the new mind, all right? And I know that sounds a little bit out of there, but basically, you basically your genetic makeup on how you were born and how you look was going to determine, which is sort of interesting because that sort of talks about what uh, sort of uh, profiling someone. Um, and, uh, all right, so I guess I should have clicked to some of these, so you can go ahead and take a quick look at, at them real quick. But, uh, by the middle of the 20th century, 
the uh, biological theories had fallen out of favor. And basically just people just thought that, you know what, this is a bunch of hogwash. Um, and there's no really reason to actually follow this. However, he was seen as the father of criminology because he basically wanted to try to understand from a biological view um, how it was that people were getting involved in this. Uh, not just juveniles, but actually adults as well, too. So uh, the contemporary trait theory uh, for the most of the 20th century, delinquency research focused on social factors now. So again, we sort of moved um, a little bit away from that of um, solely just looking at the way that somebody looks or how long their forearms are or their nose. And we actually, it was sort of intertwined between that and um, uh, that of their environmental factors, what actually leads to behavior patterns. And so now we sort of bring not only that, but it, it actually has taken on a new toll where it actually talked about the biosocial theories. So again, it continues to elevate where it came from just um, uh, with Lombroso of just looking at the way the person looks to next looking at their social uh, environment and how it was that they uh, look. And now the biosocial actually talks about the child's physical and biological makeup. So they're looking at their psychological traits rather than their uh, how it is that they look. This is where it really starts to get interesting. Hopefully you're interested still in not sleeping. So, so you can read that section right there. And then obviously it focuses on the association between biological conditions, environmental conditions, and antisocial behaviors. <clears throat> but basically what this means is that it is a view that both thought and behavior have biological and sociological basis. Um, when I offer this up, there's going to be now another breakdown within the biological, uh, biosocial theories that has to do with biochemical factors, your neurological functioning, and your genetic history. I promise I'm going to try to make this as easy as possible. Um, in my master's program, we probably spent two weeks in this area. Um, so I'm going to try to break it down and make it as easy as possible for you here. So within the, let me see if I can go to this next slide. Okay, great. Okay. So uh, within the biological uh, or biochemical factors, um, there definitely is relationships between antisocial behavior and biochemical uh, makeup. And what they're talking about is um, the biochemical problems can begin at conception. Um, and obviously, if you're familiar with uh, like maternal alcohol abuse, uh, when the gestation period is going on and um, they will end up, there is a link in the future for those with antisocial behavior. <clears throat> if I hadn't mentioned this, I don't think it was this class. I think I made it in corrections. Uh, so I, I'll offer it up to the other folks here. But basically, I, I'm, I, I'm aware that there is a studies that are being found that goes back to not only just the ingestation but if the uh, father had been drinking or using drugs during the time that intercourse was taking place, that the sperm was being damaged and uh, was out of sorts. And again, so we're uh, having it even at the point of conception, uh, not even when it's in the, the mother's womb. So if you can figure this out, of if that is occurring, Right. If that is occurring then and then coupled with maternal alcohol abuse, we're sort of getting into the, your understanding on why it is um, that uh, they're, you know, the, the kid's just not going to have a chance because they're damaged from the get go. Um, so we also have some environmental uh, contamination, such as children exposed to high level of air pollution. Um, uh, but think about it as well, too. Um, I have some very good friends of mine that just moved here from Flint, Michigan. Uh, a lot of my family is from the east side of the state. 
And um, if you're not familiar with the water, that was a, a problem over there um, for quite a long time and still is a problem. So, again, the, the children that were inside the room were uh, getting uh, basically fed lead and contaminated water. And for how much generations to come is that going to already uh, cause uh, future problems uh, for not only that city, but even spread out if those children end up having uh, babies when they get older and they're already damaged. So you can see it's sort of a snowballing effect. Um, this part here is like the hormone levels and stuff of that nature. This was, this was a little bit interesting to me, um, and I'm going to take it as this when I was reading this over, is that when uh, you are in a, uh, a state of where you are uh, like using steroids or you are at a point where you have exposed to testosterone, which again, they're talking about steroids, you will then be, as a child, when you grow up, you will also have more aggressive and antisocial behavior. Whew. Okay, that's a lot to say there. Let me see if this side, okay. Now, one of the things that weren't on a slide, which I was surprised um, from not this neurological, but the biochemical factors, um, they talked about in your book on page 74 uh, about diet and delinquency. Um, you're probably aware that uh, your mothers uh, from whom you were born from um, were taking uh, what's called prenatal medicine and having prenatal um, yeah, prenatal medicine and prenatal uh, appointments. Uh, most of the time in impoverished neighborhoods, this just doesn't take place. Or again, if you are a juvenile, you may miss the first four or five months of your pregnancy because you just don't want to um, go ahead and uh, tell anybody that you're pregnant. But they're basically showing that research over the past decade, it shows that either a over or under certain, or under or un, blah, 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 you ready? Over or under supply of certain chemicals and minerals in, in an adolescent's diet, and they list them off here, has been associated with crime and delinquency. So again, if you are in the womb and you are not getting these certain medicines or these certain uh, uh, like sodium and magnesium and stuff of that nature and you're too high or too low, they're associated with crime and delinquency. Also, as, uh, th those with poor diet is also interdirected with uh, antisocial activity. Which, uh, um, again, you know, ADHD is not a crime or anything of that nature. But what they're essentially finding out is that, that folks that um, have do have ADHD do have a higher propensity to not do as well in school, not to have uh, uh, social supports uh, like we talked about in our first couple slides. And so they're more apt to go to a delinquent behavior um, because of their ADHD. Um, not all. But they're more likely to. Okay. So, anyways, so now we're going to get into the neurological dysfunctions. And I apologize that it took so long to talk about that, but I did want to get that out because I thought it was important. Um, so the neurological dysfunction. So, like this neurological dysfunction again. This is another factor that follows under the uh, biosocial uh, theory. And basically what this is saying, as you can see in front of you here, that basically there's a, what's called MBDs, and, ba and those MBDs are associated with antisocial behavior. And the reason why is because those that have MB MBDs also most likely have ADHDs. We talked about that a second ago, is that if uh, a child is showing that they're in a, inappropriate, they're their development, inappropriate lack of attention and impulse, there's more of a possibility that they're not going to do well in school. Um, the learning disabilities, arrested children have a higher rate of, 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 of LDs than children in a general population. It's because why? They won't do well in school or a skill session. And then there's also that falls under what's called the arousal theory. And the arousal theory 
arousal theory also uh, basically talks about that um, that they will get into crimes because they like that thrill of you know basically uh, trying to get away with it, and so you know what they're in this aid this uh, uh, having this minimal brain dysfunction. Um, they will actually go out and do stuff, as it says here, sort of thrill and sensation seekers. Um, you know, not everyone has a chance to drop off a bridge with a bungee cord or skydive or whatever it may be. So they look towards other things to try to get this stimulation. Um, one of the things that I did miss, i sorry to keep going back, but I did miss earlier uh, when we were talking about like uh, ADHD and stuff of that nature and just looking over the text real quick, I wanted to bring up that it wasn't just only just poor schools, but uh, that also the ADHD, it also talked about uh, it included more high dropout rate. They were more apt to bully, stubbornness, mental disorder, uh, a lack of response to discipline. Um, so again, that's they're more like kids that are ADHD are more likely than non-ADHD use to use illicit drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. And again, this all stems back to what? It's all it all stems back to what's going on in the womb. So they're again, I don't want to say damaged goods, but essentially that's intact what they're spot they're talking about here. So genetic influences. Got another good topic, in it, and this essentially says that uh, this assumes that antisocial anti behavior is inherited. Uh, the genetic makeup of parent is passed on to a children. Genetic abnormalities is directed linked to antisocial behaviors. But uh, there's, you know, in in and that's in the the general sense. But there's three approaches to test the association. Um, and this essentially was what's called a parental deviance. Ah, oh, son of a biscuit. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to talk to a, a blank page here, but we're gonna get back to um, like the genetic influences. Not this slide, but the slide that I went past. I haven't figured out how to go back. I guess it's my fault, uh, but I'll make it quicker on this. So there's three tests to that, which is uh, like the parental de deviance, the twin studies, um, and there's what's called the adoption studies. And so that parental deviance basically talks about how there is actually um, intergenerational crime that takes place. Um, they've had a couple studies where it basically shows that uh, criminal fathers produce criminal sons who then produce criminal grandchildren. But there are some things inside of that that actually uh, do change up, change matters a little bit. I mean, um, what we can say is that um, they are, because most criminal activities are taking place uh, in impoverished neighborhoods, so that can also have where the delinquent peers are also having uh, input with them. Um, uh, so again, we. You know, again, that's just right now just showing like you, you like they can't like just take a child without having other social influences out there as well, too. So then that that sort of flew into there of what's called the uh, twin studies. And this was sort of an interesting situation. But basically, there were two twins in Minnesota that were. Uh, sort of separated at birth, and um, they they both have uh, like their. So this is quite interesting, um, and basically what this study showed is that uh, twins that um, uh, when I say twins, I'm going to talk about twins that are fraternal twins and identical twins. So fraternal twin. Uh, Fraternal twins only share 50% of their genes with each other, where identical shares a, a, a much larger percentage. Obviously, um, we can say up to 100% because we know that that's, uh, that's true. Otherwise, they would be uh, fraternal. But the long and short of it is, is that they're shown in this Minnesota study that those kids that are identical will end up 
having nearly the same criminal pathways as the other ones that they've been separated from. So again, there is some type of uh, link in the genes theory um, where those that were fraternal may not. Now, what they did find in some of these theories or some of this was in um, some of the findings that they found in the twin studies were that uh, some of the higher risk, this is interesting, for suicidal behavior among identical twins were higher than those of fraternal twins. They found out that uh, measuring their uh, psychological dysfunctions, uh, such as uh, their uh, conduct disorders or impulsivity and antisocial behavior, found it more corresponding for those with uh, identical than fraternal. And um, one of the other things in here that I thought it was interesting is that uh, when identical twins suffer from child abuse, they are more likely to engage in antisocial activity than if their fraternal uh, twins were to seek uh, or were to suffer from child abuse. I know that's a lot in there, but um, I apologize because I know I got to talk about uh, psychological theories now um, as far as uh, getting into this uh, slide. So I apologize about that, but we'll get into this slide now. So again, with uh, psychological theories of delinquency, um, now we're going to talk about a different perspective. Um, there's three prominent perspectives within the psychological theory, um, sometimes called uh, like the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic. Um, this will date back to uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, but basically that talks about, I don't know if that's going to work here. Yep, okay, psychodynamic, you'll have the behavioral, and then you'll also have cognitive. And if you've taken a psychology class, this is where these will actually sort of dive in as well, too. Um, let me see what this next one's going to look like. Oh, good. Okay, sorry. So basically um, what they're saying here is that uh, the cause of this on a psychoanalytic level um, is that there's conflicts unknown to the actual person, um, that there's childhood trauma, um, family abuse takes place, uh, neurosis, and psychosis. And if you're not familiar with those, that's basically when, um, like neurosis means that um, it's, the mental health issues are always constant, um, and in psychot or psychosis that they come and go. So uh, then behavior, behavioral, essentially what we're looking at here is that uh, we have the learning processes, um, past experiences, stimuli, rewards, and punishment. Um, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to dive into it way too much right now, but then there's a cognitive, which is information processing, thinking, problem solving, uh, script and moral development. So in the uh, psychodynamic theory, and again, that's one of the three, we know that uh, the branch of psychology that holds the human personality is controlled by unconscious and mental processes, as I said before, that originated by Sigmund Freud. Um, there's basically three major components with this, which is called the id, the ego, and the superego. Um, if you want to read more on that, you can. Uh, this is sort of an antiquated um, uh, theory, not one that I specifically subscribe through, uh, subscribe to. But um, basically, it says that an early part in, in the early part of a, a person's life um, can that then when there's an imbalance in the personality traits, that this can result in long-term psychologically difficulties. And this also talks about other weird things that I won't talk about here as far as um, Sigmund Freud, but um, he's a very interesting uh, man, let's put it that way. Uh, the behavioral theory and cognitive theory, uh, it's one and the same, but basically they argument that personality is learned through life during interactions with others. 
uh, behavior concerns the study of observable behavior rather than the unconscious processes focusing on particular stimuli and responses to them. So kids learn through reward and uh, punishment. So again, this is a little bit still on the uh, uh, choice theory, but what he's basically saying is that you're going to learn more from your peers um, and um, through your uh, through your life pattern. <coughs> excuse me, your life pattern on uh, what you should and what you shouldn't be doing. Um, your cognitive theory studies the perception of reality and the mental processes required to understand the world that we live in. Now, and basically what that means is that you are going to be uh, triggered initially by a stimulus or change in your environment. It shows that you're going to be, um, you learn by observing how other people act and that's how you process that and that's how you end up making uh, decisions. Um, interesting enough, that was with the behavioral theory. Now again, that cognitive theory um, that was pushed through, um, it has some names in here, but Piaget um, is the one that I'm actually more familiar with. Um, it's actually Jean Piaget, P-I-A-G-E-T, uh, which unfortunately they don't have a, a lot in here on this, which I'm pretty uh, surprised. Uh, because, um, I mean, this is one of the things that are, are up and coming and, and talking about. Um, let me see what the next slide looks like. Oh, okay. So uh, basically what they're talking about with more in this cognitive theory is they're talking about how your personality uh, will, will process the information coming uh, at you. And if you have a stable patterns of behavior, including thoughts and emotion, that distinguishes one person from the other. Um, they're basically talking about uh, if you see something, right? So if you see something that's in front of you, your personality is going to decide whether you're going to actually do that crime or not. Um, drifting down into a little bit farther, Underneath this is uh, this gentleman named uh, Hans. I won't try his last name, but they talk about what's called in extroversion, which obviously is a difference in introvert. And extroverts, basically, they impulse individuals who lack the ability to examine their own motives, so they literally can't control themselves. Um, and then neurotics, uh, neuroticism is individuals who are anxious and emotionally unstable. Again, these are two underlying uh, theories within how your personality um, will influence your decision making when it comes to delinquency. Okay, good. Uh, the psycho, uh, psychopathic and personality, also known as a sociopath uh, or antisocial personality. It's a person that lacking in warmth, exhibiting appropriate behavior responses and unable to learn from experience defined by persistent violations of social norms. Um, obviously that if you're not aware of like who Charles Manson is, Ted Bundy, these are uh, people that go and kill just for the fun of it. Um, and um, they basically are, they, they just don't care about life. They just on to themselves. Um, they can be still to see it as uh, like uh, thrill seekers. Um, they're always involved in uh, risky behaviors. Um, some of them, uh, what I would say uh, at times can be shown as a uh, illegal earlier in life, but because then what happens is they become bored with it. And, um, They'll end up doing stuff that involves with uh, certain uh, substances or be involved in like truancy because um, school just has no meaning to them. So they'll just essentially get involved in bad things and then, then it sort of spirals out of control um, because of uh, basically not caring about society and the norms. Um, so. Anyways, um, I'll let you read this here. I'm getting a little hoarse right now, but um, 
basically the the difference in like the intelligence and delinquency side of it it's it's pretty simple and what it basically means is that uh, the nature theory means that you were born dumb if you have a low iq um you're going to get involved in more delinquency um and the other side of that um is they concluded that uh, the delinquents were five to ten more times likely for mentally deficient <coughs> than those for uh, non-delinquent boys. And so basically, it's always referred to what I term in short terms is basically if you were born, like Forrest said, was born stupid, um, you're you're and you're not going to end up getting. Um, And say you are going to be getting more involved in delinquency acts. Now we can actually, you know, sort of, well, I'll talk about that. They're going to talk about that in the next slide. So, but in the 30s, um, so they say it here is a more culturally sensitive explanation of behavior led to what's called the nurture theory. And basically they're not blaming the child because he has a low IQ. They're basically saying that um, it's his environment or her environment that failed to stimulate them and socially uh, socialize them. And the reason, even though they do have a low IQ, um, they will uh, still be involved in delinquency, uh, but it's up to the environment, which means the parents, schools, peer groups, and other, child's, other, other areas that create a child's IQ level. And that uh, the low IQ is involved uh, with the environment. Interesting enough, right? So now we're talking about like the trait theory. Remember how we talked about the choice theory and um, we we're talking about like uh, early on, we we're talking about the choice theory and um, how they were involved in uh, general deterrence and specific deterrence. We're gonna sort of look at this right now. Um, what their thoughts are is that uh, the trait theory and delinquency prevention is that it should be directed at strengthening a youth's home life and relationships. Um, I uh, definitely, uh, I'm, again, I'm not supposed to be putting my um, two cents in on what I believe, but I definitely have seen this as a very solid uh, evidence-based approach on uh, things that work. So individual approaches have been used in previous pre to prevent adjudicated use from engaging in further criminal activities. Uh, rehabilitation methods include psychological counseling or prescribed psychotropic medications. And if we talk about um, specifically in these biosocial theories that are the underlying of traits, um, again, and we know that um, Know, from whether it be from alcohol fetal syndrome or we know that it's ADHD or something of that nature that's when they're talking about these uh, psychological counseling and or prescribed psychotropic medics, medicines because we want to um, help that person make reasonable uh, decisions when they are being approached by things that may drag them into delinquency and if we can do that through counseling and we can do that through uh, medicine, hopefully we'll be on the right target. Uh, anyways, uh, prevention, early prevention pays off. Uh, we talked about that. It needs to uh, uh, be targeted at children's health and well-being. Um, there's an example, as we talked about, we talked about prenatal uh, uh, medicines or early infancies as well too, and making sure that uh, the mom through uh, her breast milk as well too, uh, if, if they choose to, uh, or if they can breastfeed. Um, I wanna just say uh, this last one here is, is there a danger that early prevention will labelize or stigmatize kids as a potential delinquents? And can trying to do good result in something that creates long-term long harm? And I guess I'll give you this, this my two cents on this, is that um, I can tell you that what doesn't work is not doing anything. 
And uh, so I feel that, uh, you know, we should be as uh, we're, we're, we should be there at the forefront if we can, because otherwise we know statistically that these folks that are, whether you're looking at choice or uh, the trait theories, that they're going to wind up in jail or prison. And um, that's not something that we want to have. And we don't want them to essentially go out and produce several uh, generations of criminals. So if we can be there to intervene in the beginning, and I'm not talking about us as police officers. I'm talking about us as uh, social workers, us as uh, medicine. Um, there is some... Uh, I'm not going to get into it now because I'm almost on an hour in talking, but um, there's some evidence-based practices out there that al would allow police officers, when they're coming in contact with folks in, in uh, impoverished neighborhoods, to uh, work with um, the community and making sure that they get the proper education so that they are receiving their prenatal vitamins, so that they are getting proper counseling, and they are getting proper uh, medicine. And in, uh, uh, in Kalamazoo County, they called it uh, sirens for a while. Uh, that was the program, but essentially what that mean, meant is that they were, you could uh, mark off a box that said sirens on it, and it went to the juvenile uh, if they're involved in a case, and uh, it would then bring a multi-discipline team out to uh, speak with the individual to actually get to what I call is the root of the problem, right? So summary. So as you head into your uh, discussion board right now, um, basically what I'm going to ask you to do here is... Um, to give me a, uh, pick out one of these eight topics that are on here and you're going to give uh, me an answer for one of the eight. What I would offer up to you is this, is don't find the easiest one. Don't find the easiest one. And, um, I'm sorry, there's not going to be eight. There's going to be a few shorter than that. But don't find the easiest one. Find one of interest and elaborate on you. Because when we head into our final projects, that's essentially where you're going to start your application and you're going to want to be able to use the notes that you're doing now in your final application. So don't be short. Don't be 250 words. Don't come in at 259 make an elaborate that's why i broke this down for this chapter to just do one class tonight so that you can put your time and effort in it which is going to help you out in your 200 point your 200 point exam at the end of the year okay hopefully i didn't bore you to death and hopefully you can go back if you need to uh give me a bump if you have any questions uh, however i did finish under an hour take care